Hello listeners, this is the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the fourth and final quarter of 2024. Yes, and welcome to the reading of lesson number four, titled Witnesses of Christ as the Messiah. It's ready for teaching on October 26 and is part of the series on the Gospel of John, written by Edward Zinke and Thomas R. Shepherd. And I'm Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, October 19. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Once again, we thank you for your word. It's so precious to us, and particularly the book of John, which so simply and elegantly describes for us who Jesus is, who he was, who he became, and who he remains. And as we open your word this week to look at those who saw Christ as the Messiah and discovered it for themselves, We pray, Lord, that your word will jump out at us, that we too will accept Jesus, not just as our Saviour, but as the guide for our lives, and that we may show that to those around us. And today I'd like to pray for Rowan Hoper of Costa Rica and Ignacio Holmes and Lola Spencer and her children, including Festus and Christine Lorraine Allen and Matthew Burford. Lord, these people have asked for prayer, and I I pray that you'll continue to be with them. May they know that not only is Jesus the Messiah, but he is the one who walks with them day by day. May your Holy Spirit guide us as we open your word. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week comes from the book of John, chapter 3 and verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Let's read that again, John chapter 3 and verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. No question, Jesus provided people with powerful scriptural evidence to back up the claims that he had been making about himself, including in John 6.47, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. But there's more. Turning water into wine feeding thousands with a few loaves of bread, healing the nobleman's son, restoring the man at the pool of Bethesda, giving sight to the one blind from birth, raising Lazarus from the dead. The evangelist calls on a variety of events and people, Jew, Gentile, rich, poor, male, female, rulers, commoners, educated and uneducated, to bear witness to who Jesus is. John points even to the witness of the Father himself and to Scripture, all giving evidence of Jesus' identity. This week begins with the powerful witness of John the Baptist. Other witnesses come on the stage as well, Andrew and Simon Peter, Philip and Nathaniel, and a most unexpected witness, the Pharisee Nicodemus. But another witness stands back in the shadows, that other disciple with Andrew in John one thirty five and 40. John himself. Let's look at those two verses. John chapter 1 and verse 35. The next day John was there again with two of his disciples. And verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. Sunday, October 20, the testimony of John the Baptist. As last week's lesson illustrated, the Gospel of John begins with Jesus Christ, the Word, in his eternal existence before creation. But in that same prologue, John the Baptist appears as a witness to Jesus. Some Jews in Jesus' time expected two messiahs, one priestly and the other royal, John clearly teaches that John the Baptist did not claim to be one of these messiahs, but rather was a witness to the one true messiah. 
read John 1, 19-23. How did John the Baptist explain his ministry and mission? John 1, beginning at verse 19. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, Then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Finally they said, Who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. The religious leaders sent priests and Levites to ask John who he was. With messianic expectations high in Judea, it was important for John the Baptist to clarify his relationship to those expectations. He was not the light, but he was sent from God to bear witness to the light and to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. We read about this in John chapter 1 verses 6 to 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not that light. He came only as a witness to the light. That's why he answered them as plainly as he could, saying in John 1 verse 20, I am not the Christ. Also, John baptized with water, but Christ would baptize with the Spirit, as we read in John chapter 1, verse 26. I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one who you do not know. And then in verse 33, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. John was not worthy to loosen Jesus' sandal strap. He said in verse 27, He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Christ was preferred before John because he was before John, as we read in verse 30. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. Jesus was the Son of God, and John merely pointed to him, as you read in verse 34. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Read Isaiah 40, verses 1 to 5, and John chapter 1, verse 23. How does John use these verses? Isaiah 40, beginning at verse 1. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice of one calling, In the wilderness prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And John one twenty three. John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. In the days of rutted and rock-filled roads, servants were sometimes sent ahead of the king to level the surfaces of roadways and to take out sharp turns so as to smooth the way of the king. So, in fulfilment of prophecy, John came in order to prepare the hearts of the people for Jesus. And so, to finish today, in what way should we, as Seventh-day Adventists, do the same kind of ministry as did John the Baptist? What are the parallels? Monday, October 21 
the Lamb of God. The Hebrew nation was looking for a Messiah who would deliver them from Rome. The goal of the Gospel of John was to change their understanding of the Messiah so that they could recognize in Jesus the fulfillment of the prophecies regarding the coming King. The Messiah would not be an earthly ruler. He came to fulfill all the Old Testament promises concerning himself, which include his self-sacrifice in behalf of the world, and to renew the relationship between God and his people. Read John chapter 1, verses 29 to 37. What proclamation does John the Baptist make about Jesus? What image does he use to depict him? And why is it so significant in understanding who Jesus was and what his mission would be? John chapter 1, beginning at verse 29. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen, and I testify, that this is God's chosen one." The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. The statement of the Baptist regarding Jesus as the Lamb of God supports the purpose of John's Gospel, which is to bring about a renewed understanding of the work and nature of the Messiah. Jesus would indeed be the fulfilment of the promise of the sacrificial system, going back to the promise of the Redeemer first given in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And you'll remember that. It reads, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. And then a quote from Ellen White in The Desire of Ages, page 136. When at the baptism of Jesus, John pointed to him as the Lamb of God, a new light was shed upon the Messiah's work. The prophet's mind was directed to the words of Isaiah. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, in Isaiah 53, verse 7. End of quote. Read Mark 10, 45, Romans 5, 6, and 1 Peter 2, 24. How do these verses help us understand the role of Jesus as the Lamb of God? First of all, Mark 10.45, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And Romans 5, verse 6, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. And then 1 Peter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. However much more John the Baptist needed to know about the ministry of Jesus, he was certain that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the one who had come in fulfilment of prophecy. So to finish today, consider deeply Jesus' title as the Lamb of God. What images does it bring to mind? And how does its linkage to the Old Testament sacrificial system help you appreciate the great price of our salvation? Tuesday, October 22, The Two Disciples of John Two disciples of John the Baptist were standing with him when Jesus walked by. John declared, in John 1.36, Behold the Lamb of God. 
The two disciples had listened to John's message about the Christ, who would fulfill the Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah. The disciples left John to follow Jesus, recognising that Jesus was greater than John the Baptist and that he was the fulfilment of John's message. Read John chapter 1, verses 35 to 39. What did these two disciples do after hearing John's witness about Jesus? John 1, beginning at verse 35, The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Desiring to be with Jesus, the two spent the day with him. Who knows what amazing things they had learned and experienced then. They must have been great things because, before long, their desire was to share their experience with others. Andrew, one of the two disciples, immediately found his brother Simon and said in John 1.41, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. When Andrew brought his brother to Jesus, Jesus immediately showed that he knew him, saying in John 1.42, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas. Jesus knew and understood Peter. That Jesus knows a person is a motif of the Gospel of John. See, for example, John 2, verses 24 and 25. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. And then we have this paragraph from The Desire of Ages, page 139. If John and Andrew had possessed the unbelieving spirit of the priests and rulers, they would not have been found as learners at the feet of Jesus. They would have come to him as critics to judge his words. But Not so did these first disciples. They had responded to the Holy Spirit's call in the preaching of John the Baptist. Now they recognised the voice of the heavenly teacher. A divine illumination was shed upon the teaching of the Old Testament scriptures. The many-sided themes of truth stood out in new light. End of quote. The entire emphasis of the Gospel of John is to bring to light who Jesus is, so that this good news may be shared with the world. And so to finish today, in what ways has Christ and your faith in Christ changed your life? What other changes would you still like to see happen? Wednesday, October 23, Philip and Nathaniel. Read John chapter 1, verses 43 to 46. What did Philip's message reveal about his faith in Jesus already? John 1, beginning at verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. Philip was from Bethsaida, as were Andrew and Peter. He found his friend Nathanael and told him about Jesus. John the Baptist had called Jesus the Lamb of God. Andrew had told Peter that he had found the Messiah. But Philip calls Jesus the one Moses and the prophets wrote about and adds the name Jesus of Nazareth. His reference to Nazareth sets off a sharp reaction from his friend. Nathaniel seems to have been prejudiced against the little town of Nazareth. Surely, 
a king would not come from such a wayside location. Prejudice easily blinds the eyes from seeing people for what they are really worth. Philip seems to have recognised, possibly from previous conversations with Nathaniel, that the proper way to deal with prejudice is not some exalted philosophical or theological argumentation, but rather to invite the individual to experience the truth personally for themselves. He simply says, Come and see. And that is exactly what Nathaniel did. He went and saw. Read John chapter 1, verses 47 to 51. How did Jesus convince Nathanael of who he was, and what was Nathanael's response? John 1, beginning at verse 47. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree, before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. He then added, Very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Missing between verse 46 and verse 47 is the crucial detail of just how Nathaniel responded to Philip's invitation. He got up and went to see, however. His friendship with Philip was stronger than his prejudice, and his life would be changed from that moment on. Jesus says nice words about Nathaniel, calling him an Israelite in whom there is no deceit in verse 47, a great contrast from what Nathaniel had said about Jesus in the previous verse, verse 46. Nathaniel responds with surprise because he had not met Jesus before. Then Jesus refers to seeing him under a fig tree, and this small statement convinces Nathaniel. Jesus, by divine insight, had seen Nathanael praying, searching for truth under that tree. See Ellen G. White, The Desire of Ages, page 140 and 141. Nathanael then makes an exalted confession, calling Jesus Rabbi, the Son of God, and the King of Israel. Note how this seemingly small revelation leads to a grand confession of faith. Thursday, October 24, The Witness of Nicodemus. Read John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. How does the testimony of Nicodemus support the theme of the Gospel of John? John chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. Now, there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Nicodemus was a respected teacher in Israel and a wealthy member of the Sanhedrin. His testimony plays an important part in John's Gospel for several reasons. He referred to Jesus as Rabbi and pointed to the signs that Jesus performed as evidence of his divine mission. Hence, even before Nicodemus realised what he was doing, he was giving evidence in support of the Messiahship of Jesus. Nicodemus viewed the signs themselves as evidence of Jesus' divine calling but did not see them as pointing to Jesus as the fulfilment of the Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah. So, Nicodemus came with some doubt. He did not yet at this point recognise Jesus as the Christ. Read John chapter 3, verses 3 to 21. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus to show that he could see right through him? Let's begin John chapter 3 at verse 3. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. 
Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it is coming from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and do you not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but Whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into this world. But people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But Whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. Jesus knows the heart of each individual. His response to Nicodemus may seem abrupt, but he goes directly to the issue. Though the Jews believed that Gentiles needed to be converted, many didn't understand that they, too, the chosen people, needed a conversion experience. No one is born saved, regardless of their nationality or the church that they were raised in. Without question, the Jews' wonderful heritage, going back to Abraham, offered them many distinct advantages, as we see in Romans chapter 3, verses one and two. And that reads, what advantage then is there in being a Jew, or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, the Jews have been entrusted with the very words of God. But in and of itself, that was not enough. Jesus told Nicodemus the unthinkable, that he, a teacher and ruler in Israel, must be born again from above. Jesus then confronted Nicodemus with his own spiritual ignorance. In John 3.10 we read, Are you the teacher of Israel, and do not know these things? How could you, an exalted teacher, not know this? The rebuke must have been stunning. Despite whatever questions he had regarding Jesus then, Nicodemus later took his side with the followers of Jesus, as we read in John 19.39. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. And so to finish today, what does it mean to be born again? And why would Jesus put such emphasis on it? Friday, October 25, Further Thought Nicodemus, as we read in The Desire of Ages, page 175 and 176, searched the scriptures in a new way, not for the discussion of a theory, but in order to receive life for the soul. He began to see the kingdom of heaven as he submitted himself to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Through faith, 
we receive the grace of God, but faith is not our saviour. It earns nothing. It is the hand by which we lay hold upon Christ and appropriate his merits, the remedy for sin. Repentance comes from Christ as truly as does pardon. How then are we to be saved? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man has been lifted up. And every one who has been deceived and bitten by the serpent may look and live. John one twenty nine reads, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The light shining from the cross reveals the love of God. His love is drawing us to himself. If we do not resist this drawing, we shall be led to the foot of the cross in repentance for the sins that have crucified the Saviour. Then the Spirit of God, through faith, produces a new life in the soul. The thoughts and desires are brought into obedience to the will of Christ. The heart, the mind, are created anew in the image of Him who works in us to subdue all things to Himself. Then the law of God is written in the mind and heart, and we can say with Christ, I delight to do thy will, O my God, as it says in Psalm 40, verse 8. End of quote. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. 1. John the Baptist came to prepare the way for Jesus. How successful would you judge his ministry to have been, at least from a human perspective? Also, as you think about your answer, ask this important question. How do you define success in spiritual things? And question two, later on, John the Baptist expressed some sincere doubts, as we read in Matthew 11, verses 2 and 3, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come? Or... Should we expect someone else? And then in Luke 7.19, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? What caused his questions? And what can we learn from them about how to be firm in our faith? And question three. In class, discuss the idea of how someone such as Nicodemus a leader in the true church, someone who surely had a lot of knowledge, could still be so spiritually ignorant of what really matters. What lessons can we take from his situation? And reading our inside story, our mission story for this week is Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Power of Prayer in Uzbekistan by Andrew McChesney An ambulance rushed 36-year-old Nagora to the hospital in Tashkent, Uzbekistan. She could barely talk. Her arms were numb. She was struggling to swallow. The doctor couldn't diagnose her condition. Nagora grew worse over the next month in the hospital. She couldn't sleep for more than 15 minutes a day. X-rays showed an activity in her brain. Then a second doctor said Nagora had a terminal illness. He saw no hope. Nagora didn't believe in Jesus, but she had Seventh-day Adventist neighbours who did. They visited her in intensive care and asked for permission to invite their church pastor to come and pray with her. No, no, Nagora said. I'm not well. I look terrible. Tell him to come when I feel better. But the neighbours insisted. Let him come and pray for you, they said. Reluctantly, Nagora agreed. A day later, the pastor and his wife came to Nagora's bed. The pastor read Psalm 23, anointed Nagora's forehead with oil, and prayed, Lord, give health to our sister. Give her healing so she can make a full recovery. Nagora didn't feel any different after the prayer. The next day, the pastor and his wife returned. Again, he read from the Bible, anointed her, and prayed. Again, Nagora didn't feel any different. But that night, she was able to sleep for several hours, not for 15 minutes. The third day, the pastor and his wife returned. Again, he read from the Bible, anointed her and prayed. Again, she didn't feel any different. But that night, she slept the whole night. 
After that, she slept well every night. The pastor and his wife continued to visit. Slowly, Nagora's speech improved. Her arms and legs began to function. Hospital x-rays showed that her brain activity had returned to normal. The doctor was astonished. It's impossible that you have recovered and so quickly, he said. Four months after the pastor began praying, Nagora was driving her car and back to work. The woman who hadn't believed in God credited him for her recovery. This is a miracle of God, she said. She is glad to have neighbours who cared for her. I'm very grateful to God that he gave me these kind of friends, who are like family, she said, speaking slowly but clearly in an interview with Adventist Mission. Although Nagora believes in God, she has not given her heart to him. A discouraging factor may be that many people in Uzbekistan view Seventh-day Adventists as members of a sect. Please pray for Nagora and others like her who have witnessed God's power in their lives but have yet to make a decision for him. Nagora is a pseudonym. These stories are provided by the General Conference Office of Adventist Mission, which uses Sabbath school mission offerings to spread the gospel word worldwide. Read new stories daily at adventistmission.org.